Hey, welcome back. Um, I'm Pastor Eric Longman. Uh, delighted to welcome you back to our uh, fourth now new member class session for Holy Trinity Lutheran Church. Great to have you with us. You know, I got to say before we get into this, if you prefer to read a story from beginning to end, like most of us do, you probably want to go to our homepage, holytrend.org. Look under the info tab for new member class. That'll take you to the screen where you can get to sessions one, two, and three before you get to this one. Um, on the other hand, hey, if you don't mind jumping into a story in the middle of it, rock and roll. You're welcome to join us for session four. Now, this time we're talking about something called the means of grace, and we touched on this a little bit last time. It's basically the idea that the Holy Spirit doesn't, you know, pounce on you out of nowhere. Um, God actually uses means to come to you, kind of in the same way that um, we use a fork or a spoon as the means to get food from our plate into our mouth. Well, God uses means too. He uses words, both written and spoken. He uses water. He uses bread and wine. All of these ways that he comes to us uh, and reveals himself to us and, and gives his blessings to us. So we're going to talk about that. And today we're going to specifically talk about words. We're going to talk about the Bible and Holy Scripture. Um, and we're going to talk about baptism. And then next week, or the next session, we'll talk more about the Lord's Supper, and we'll talk about the church as the body of Christ. So let me go ahead and share my screen here, and uh, we'll pick up from there and move on. Um, we're going to begin with an opening prayer, as we've done in the past. And, you know, I've been trying to do different ways and different types of prayers. Um, last time, I think for the opening prayer, we used a, a pre-written prayer that was in our hymnal. This time what I want to use is a, a hymn for our prayer. We'll kind of adapt from a hymn that's in our hymnal um, and use that as a way of praying. It's kind of a way of speaking um, God's words back to him in a sense. Um, so this is from hymn number 617 in the Lutheran service book. It's called, O Lord, We Praise Thee. So we'll begin with this prayer. O Lord, we praise you, bless you, and adore you. In thanksgiving, we bow before you. You nourish our weak souls with your body and blood so that they may flourish. O oh Lord, have mercy. Your holy body was given into death in order to win for us life in heaven. No greater love than this could bind us to you. May our feast of holy communion remind us always of this. O oh Lord, have mercy. May God grant us his grace and favor so that we would always follow Christ our Savior and live together in love and unity, never despising this blessed communion. O oh Lord, have mercy. Amen. So we're talking today about the means of grace. And we can't talk about the means of grace unless we start with talking about the Word, Holy Scripture. Now the means of grace are among the things that kind of set LCMS Lutherans apart from other church bodies. We believe that God only works through certain means. And the foundation of all of that is his word. Now, that's not to say that we're limiting God. I mean, God can do whatever he wants, but God has limited himself. He's promised to be present in his word. And that's where we can know for sure that we can find him, because he said so. So we can't confidently find God and all that he wants to reveal to us about himself anywhere else but in his word, which we believe is inspired by God and is without error. Now, this is an important point. We believe, teach, and confess that God's word, the Holy Bible, both Old and New Testaments, is the inspired, inerrant word of God. Inspired, meaning that God led men to write what he directed so that we understand and we hear the words as coming from God himself. Inerrant, meaning that the original words are without error and are completely correct. We believe that the Bible is the word of God, all of it. Now compare that to other church bodies that teach that the Bible contains the word of God. That's a subtle distinction, but it's extremely important. Because if it is the Word of God, well, then all of it matters. Well, if it just contains the Word of God, 
you're left to discern the parts that are the word of God and the parts that might not be. And that's a dangerous place to be because it kind of leaves you in the unenviable position of having to find God like a needle in a haystack. And the unfortunate outcome of that search every time is that the reader will ultimately create their own God, little g. And that'll be a God who conforms to all of their sinful desires. And that's not helpful. Scripture is God's word. And it serves three purposes, really. First, it reveals who God is. We get to learn about God and from his perspective, which is pretty cool. Second, it reveals who we are from God's perspective again. We get to see that we are God's creation, his beloved creatures whom he cares for and who he provides for. And we get to see that from God's perspective. And third, and perhaps most important, scripture reveals to us God's plan of salvation, Jesus Christ. I mean, ultimately, it's all about Jesus. It's about Jesus and his cross through which he won salvation for all people. Jesus himself said, you search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life, and it is they that bear witness about me. So Jesus himself reminds us that as we read scripture, what we're always looking for is the revelation of Jesus Christ and an understanding of who he is and of who we are. Now, look at scripture itself and look at how it talks about itself. The Word of God. Paul in Romans 1.16 says, the Word of God is the power of God for salvation. That's pretty powerful stuff. First Peter says that the Word endures forever. And my goodness, history has already borne that out. Over the period of 4,000 years or so that we've had this written record, it has been preserved intact, unlike any other work of literature in all of history. Romans, Paul writing to the Romans, again in Romans 10, says that the word produces faith. Romans 10, 17 says, faith comes from hearing, hearing through the word of God. So the word of God has this amazing power to bring us to faith and to trust in Jesus Christ, who is our salvation. 2 Timothy chapter 3 says that the word is breathed out by God, and it's useful breathed out, that word inspired, you know, kind of reminds us of that. But these are words that God himself gave to us, and they're words that are useful and powerful. And finally, we're going to talk about this, that the word is actually divided into two teachings. And it's very, very helpful and sort of unique to the Lutheran church that we understand scripture in this way. Scripture contains both law and gospel. Now, C.F.W. Walther, who was one of the founding fathers of the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod, has been quoted as saying that the doctrinal contents of the Holy Scripture, both the Old and the New Testament, consists of two doctrines or teachings that differ fundamentally from each other. The two doctrines are law and gospel. If you look at the chart that you see on this uh, slide here, you'll see the distinction between the two. Now, we use an SOS way to remember them. And this is something that we use with our confirmation kids as a way to kind of help them key into what's going on. But law shows us our sin. When we talk about law, predominantly we're talking about the Ten Commandments, but we're also talking about all the other things in Scripture that reveal to us how far short of the glory of God we all come. So it commands good works of thought and of word and of deed, and it condemns and punishes sin. But most importantly, the law readies our hearts to receive the gospel. Because the law always condemns. The law always shows us our shortcomings. And when we compare ourselves to God's law, well, that's not a great place to be. Because we understand that we are condemned, that we are sinful, and that the wages of sin is death. And that's a pretty scary place to be. So the law shows our sin. Now contrast that with the gospel, which shows us our Savior. The gospel reveals to us Jesus Christ. It reveals to us the forgiveness of sins that we have through him and through his death and resurrection. It reveals to us God's love, the good news 
of the salvation that we have in Jesus Christ. It gives us forgiveness, faith, life, power to please him with good works. Because everything that's done in faith is a good work. And finally, it comforts us. Because the gospel frees us from the condemnation of the law. Put it this way. The law is the place where Satan loves to hang out. Because he wants to accuse you with the law. Satan's favorite trick is to remind you of the things that you've done and the ways that you fall short of the glory of God. And what he will do is say, yeah, God forgives, but remember that thing that you did? Do you think he can forgive that? Well, the gospel is an answer to that that says absolutely yes. Jesus Christ died. When he died on the cross, he took the sins of all people throughout all time on himself. He became sin who knew no sin so that we might have salvation. And the gospel speaks very loudly against the law and says, you know what? It is true that your sin means that you deserve nothing but death. But Jesus Christ solved that problem. He came and died so that you might have eternal life. That's why the gospel is so powerful and so important, because it releases us from the law, which keeps us slave to the things that it tells us to do. You know, when God speaks the law to us, he does it to show us how we have failed to love him and to love our neighbor, how we haven't kept the Ten Commandments, how we have earned death and condemnation from him. The law is a heavy weight. But when God speaks gospel to us, he does this to show us that he's taken away the condemnation that we earned by condemning Christ in our place on the cross. The gospel tells us that we're now worthy of eternal life because Christ took our sins away in his death and he gave us his perfect righteousness, his perfect obedience to the law in place of our sins. Now, both the law and the gospel are God's word, and they're both good. But God didn't give us the law as an end of itself. God doesn't tell us his word of law in order to leave us in condemnation. He does it in order to show us that he's taken away our condemnation in the death and the resurrection of Christ. And so the ultimate goal and the purpose of the scriptures, as St. John says when he describes his gospel, is that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. So, just like the Word, which has this amazing power to bring us to faith, there are also means of grace. We call them the sacraments, and they work in much the same way that the Word does. The sacraments are where God can be found, because guess what? He's promised to be there. The power of the sacraments actually lies in the Word, in the Word of God, and in His promises. So, what is a sacrament? Let's talk about that. The sacraments really have three attributes that define them. Now, the first one is a sacrament is something that's instituted by God. That is to say that God has given it to us as a means through which he will work. You can have confidence that this is where God is working because he's given it to us. And he's given it to us, guess where? In his word. Second, in order to be a sacrament, there is the use of a visible element. See, God's chosen to work through the ordinary things of creation. Words, water, bread, wine. Third, a sacrament offers forgiveness of sins. See, sacraments are about God giving us forgiveness, life, salvation. All of these things happen through these means of grace called the sacraments. Now, using that definition, instituted by God, visible element, offers forgiveness of sins. There are two sacraments in the Lutheran Church, or maybe three. Depends on how you choose to understand it. Two for sure. One, holy baptism. Holy baptism is a work of God by which he brings us into the family of the church, right? It's how he applies his promise to us individually. And Holy Communion is the second one, or the Sacrament of the Altar, 
or the Lord's Supper or the Sacrament of the Altar. We have lots of different names for it. But the Sacrament of the Altar, Holy Communion, is Jesus' body and blood given to us in, with, and under the bread and the wine, which strengthens our faith and which forgives our sins. Now, any guesses about what the third possible sacrament might be? Well, some people would argue that confession and absolution is a sacrament. And I'll buy that, almost. The problem is, where's the visible element? Now, it was definitely instituted by God. You can find that in John chapter 20, verse 20, where he says that we should forgive sin. And it certainly offers forgiveness of sins. I mean, that's obvious on the face. But where is the visible element? You might say the pastor is the visible element as he stands in front of you to announce God's forgiveness and his grace, but that seems a little tenuous. And the fact of the matter is that Luther even waffled on this a little bit. But we pretty much stick with saying that there are two sacraments. That would be holy baptism and the Lord's Supper. Now, like I said, three things that make a sacrament. It's instituted by God. God himself has joined his word of promise to a visible element and through which God offers, gives, and seals the forgiveness of sins that have been earned for us by Christ. That's a sacrament. So let's talk about baptism now. Here's the question that we often have to grapple with. Is baptism man's act or is it God's? That is to say, who is the primary actor in baptism? Or you might say, who's the subject of the verbs? When you read the verses listed in this chart on the right, it's pretty clear that baptism is actually God's work for and in us. And think about it. Baptism makes disciples, as it says in Matthew 28, 19. That's the Great Commission. God says, go forth, make disciples. How do you do it? Baptizing and teaching. It saves you. That's Mark 16 and uh, 1 Peter chapter 3. It offers forgiveness, washes away sins, takes away guilt. It causes us to be born from above. It renews the Holy Spirit. Baptism crucifies the old Adam, as we sometimes say, the original sin that we carry with us. And it buries him. And then it causes us to be raised up as a new creation of God. It brings you into the church, making you a member of Christ's body. It gives you the Holy Spirit, makes you an heir of the promise. And in all of these things, the subject of the verbs is God. He's the doer. We're the recipient, always. Now, we read these passages and we think, well, how can water do such great things? Well, Luther gives the answer. It's not just the water. But again, it's the Word of God combined with the water that does these great things. You see the quote on the screen, baptism is not just plain water. In fact, we get it from the sink. But it's the water included in God's command and combined with God's Word. That's how it works. Now let's take a look at our uh, little catechisms. If you've got this simple explanation of Christianity, you'll find this stuff on page 15. Um, if you have another catechism, look for the section on the sacrament of holy baptism. And you can pause now if you need to to go grab that. But here's, the, here's what we're going to say about holy baptism. The first thing is, what is baptism? Well, that's what we just said. Baptism is not just plain water. It's the water included in God's command and combined with God's word. And which is that word of God? Well, Christ our Lord says in the last chapter of Matthew, Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. That's the command given by God that we should baptize. Now the second point, what benefits does baptism give? Well, it works forgiveness of sins. It rescues from death and the devil. And it gives eternal salvation to all who believe this just as the words and the promises of God declare. So what are these words and promises of God? Well, Christ our Lord says in the last chapter of Mark, whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. That's Mark 16, verse 6. 
Third point, how can water do such great things? Well, it's certainly not just water, but the word of God in and with the water that does these things, along with the faith which trusts this word of God in the water. For without God's word, the water is plain water and no baptism. But with the word of God, it is baptism. That is a life-giving water, rich in grace and a washing of the new birth in the Holy Spirit. Just as St. Paul says in Titus chapter 3, he saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us generously through Jesus Christ our Savior. So that, having been justified by his grace, we might become heirs, having the hope of eternal life. This is a trustworthy saying. Now the fourth point, what does such baptizing with water indicate? Well, it indicates that the old Adam in us, and by old Adam, what Luther is talking about here is the original sin that we all have inherited from Adam. It indicates that the old Adam in us should, by daily contrition and repentance, be drowned and die with all sins and evil desires, and that a new man should daily emerge and arise to live before God in righteousness and purity forever. See, your baptism is not a one-time thing, even though it only happens once, because our baptism regenerates us every single day. It allows us to put down that old Adam who's always inside of us with our sinful nature and to rise above him to live a life over and above sin, freed from sin and the bondage of sin. And where is this written? Well, St. Paul writes in Romans chapter 6, We were buried, therefore, with Jesus through baptism into death, in order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too might live a new life. And that's what Luther has to say about baptism. Now let's poke at some of these questions that come up about that. What about this one? Are babies included? Well, are babies sinful? Yes, original sin. See, we're all infected with that. We inherited it from Adam, and it's been passed down in our DNA ever since. Think about your kids. Do you have to teach your child to share? or to be selfish, <laughs> to share. I mean, being selfish comes naturally. We're pretty good at that, aren't we? Babies need the same salvation that you and I do. Psalm 51 reminds us that children are sinners who need to be saved. Salvation is completely a gift of God. It's not something we do. This is something that God gives to us. Babies really give us the clearest example of how helpless we are to save ourselves because Babies can't do anything for themselves. You know, we talked earlier about what Paul said in Ephesians. He said, you were dead in the sins and trespasses in which, you once walk, in which you once walked, right? Well, babies are a lot like that. They can't do anything for themselves. They rely on their parents for everything. Food, clothing, clean diapers. When we stand before God, we're all helpless infants. And that's why Jesus tells us to have faith like a child. He's telling us to realize that we are helpless and that we have to rely on God for everything. Mark chapter 10 reminds us that children can have faith. And Matthew 28, 19 and Acts 2, 39 remind us that children are included when we talk about all nations. All peoples are included in God's promise. Babies, yep. You and me, yep, all people, all nations. Now what about baptism and some other questions that come up? What about rebaptism? You know, there are some church bodies who would rebaptize you when you enter their uh, fellowship. No, we would say here in the Lutheran Church that as long as you were baptized in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, then you were baptized. Man may make mistakes, but God doesn't. And so regardless of who did the baptism, as long as it was done in the name of the triune God, I'm certain that God didn't make any mistake with it. And I'm sure that he did it right. You know, God's promise made in baptism is always there. The key thing is repentance and a renewed faith in what God has accomplished in baptism. 
I mean, I may reject God's promises for a time, but that doesn't make the promise invalid. There was a great story about this that Luther used to like to tell. Somebody came to him and said, Pastor Luther, what should I do? I, I didn't actually believe when I was baptized, but I do now. Should I be baptized again? And Luther said, no, believe now, because the promise that God gave to you then still applies. This all comes down to the fact that our baptism is a work of God, and God's work is always perfect. If baptism were about me and about what I had done, then yeah, I might be a little concerned that I messed it up, didn't do something right. But because baptism is a gift given to us by God, he doesn't make mistakes. As long as it's done according to his plan and his process, it's perfectly valid. Now here's a second question. Can someone be saved without baptism? What about the thief on the cross? Sure, the word saves. Jesus saves. But here's the thing. In baptism, Jesus gives you the same promise that he gave to the thief on the cross. Today, you will be with me in paradise. And what he has set up is a process by which baptism is the normative or normal way that we become members of the church of God. And so, is it possible to be saved without baptism? Certainly. God can do what he wants. But the basic way that he has laid out for us says, you know, baptism is the way I want to give this promise to you so that you know that when I say that you're saved, you can say, I know it because I'm baptized. Now, aren't we saved by Jesus and not by baptism? Sure. But you can't separate Jesus from baptism. Look at Romans chapter 6, verses 1 through 11. We are combined together with Jesus' death in baptism. We're united to his death and to his resurrection. And so baptism and Jesus go hand in hand. So it doesn't make any sense logistically to divorce Jesus and baptism because they really all come together at the same place. Now finally this question, what role does baptism have throughout my Christian life? Well, it plays a lot of roles throughout your Christian life. You know, we talk about the fact that um, your baptism is a daily thing. Not that you're baptized every day, but that every day you remember that this promise was applied to you and that you have the certainty of your salvation in Christ. It gives you confidence. You can say, I'm baptized. There are stories about Martin Luther when he was being tormented by Satan who was holding his sins up in front of him. And Luther at one point reared back. He was so angry at Satan that he threw an ink well against the wall and screamed at him, I am baptized. And it was that certainty, that confidence of knowing that whatever our sins might be, our baptism has covered them. You know, the first words that we speak in a funeral service are these. In holy baptism, this person was covered with a robe of Christ's righteousness and baptism that covered all of his sin. We have that confidence in knowing that because we're baptized, we've been claimed by Christ. We've been sealed with the Holy Spirit, that Christ holds us in his hand and that nobody can change that. You know, we talk about repentance, and really what that is is a return to the baptismal promises day after day. Repentance itself is a word that just means to turn around, to turn away from your sin. And so our baptism allows us every day to turn away from our sinful self, our sinful nature, and to be reminded that we have been claimed by Christ every single day. Look through the section on confession and absolution, the small catechism, and you'll get a sense of what's going on there. Because in baptism, we're being reminded or in confession and absolution, we're being reminded of the forgiveness that was given to us in our baptism. There's a very strong tie between confession and absolution and baptism. And those two things come together right there. Now, we'll talk some more about that in our upcoming sessions, but that's gonna do it for today. Let's close with a prayer. Um, here's a different approach to prayer. You know, we open the prayer 
uh, open the session up by doing a prayer that was based on a hymn. Well, this time let's close using a psalm to guide our prayers. You know, the psalms, which you'll find right in the middle of the Bible, there's 150 of them. The psalms are really the hymn book or the prayer book of the church. They've been around since the time of King David. And so many of them express so many of our deepest, innermost feelings that you'll find them can be very, very um, beneficial in your prayer life. Um, I might even encourage you to spend time reading psalms every day. You know, start with a few of them in the morning, read a few in the evening. What a terrific way to get into God's head and to hear the words that he speaks to us. So let's close with a prayer. This is based on Psalm 4. It's verse 1 and then verses 6 through 8. And we'll pray, pray these words. Answer me when I call, O God of my righteousness. You have given me relief when I was in distress. Be gracious to me and hear my prayer. There are many who say, who will show us some good? Lift up the light of your face upon us, O Lord. You have put more joy in my heart than they have when their grain and wine abound. In peace, I will both lie down and sleep. For you alone, O Lord, make me dwell in safety. Amen. That's it for session four. Join us next time. We're going to continue our discussion about the means of grace. We'll talk a little bit more about confession and absolution. We're going to talk about the Lord's Supper. We're going to talk about something called the real presence. And we'll talk about the church as the body of Christ. God's blessings on your week. I'll see you next time.